Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of Indocrypt Conference 2012. We have a very, very distinguished speaker for this uh, morning to start with, Professor Ross Anderson from Cambridge University. I don't think I can really introduce him. Uh, he's so well known in this field. He is continuously defining, redefining uh, the notion of cryptology, the role of cryptology uh, in, in the world of science. So I just leave it up to Ross to carry over this morning. Thank you. Right. Can you hear me at the back? Okay, the title of my talk today is Cryptology, the New Frontier. Basically what I was thinking was this. If you are currently doing your PhD in cryptology at the university here in India, what sort of opportunities are there? What sort of things might you be thinking about in order to make sure that your research is relevant, interesting, and useful over the next 10 to 20 years? Now, my own background is that I started off as a mathematician in the 1970s, then I became a hardware engineer, then I worked in industrial sort of crypto things like ATMs and point-of-sale machines and prepayment electricity meters and tachographs and other embedded systems. Um, in my mid-30s, I went back to university and did a PhD on protocols with Roger Leedham. And um, then during the 90s, I was working on algorithms, protocols, hardware security. Uh, we had a candidate in the AES competition, for example. And over, over the past 10 years, I've been focusing more on systems and software on the economics of security, uh, which, as I'll discuss, can be important when things start to uh, achieve a global scale. Now, this is, of course, a personal view, uh, and other people have different um, perspectives on the field. Uh, we heard from Christoph yesterday uh, about the wonderful work that his group has been doing on designing cryptographic algorithms and other systems. Uh, for use in an awful lot of real embedded stuff that's really deployed on a large scale. Um, we do the same kind of thing, but with more of a system slant on it, although there is quite some overlap between the kind of things that Christoph does and the kind of things that we do with our group. Let's just step back a bit and take a view of the overall history of cryptography. Back in the 70s, we had the pioneering papers, Diffie Hellman, the idea of the digital signature, RSA, working primitives, Needham Schroeder, the protocol that evolved into Kerberos. Sorry, is this? Yeah, oh, okay, sorry. It was, it was, it, it was off, but I was deceived because the, the green light was still on. Okay. Then in the 1980s, we saw the beginnings of theory. We had papers like the Goldwasser Michali Rivest. A paper which led to the world of uh, random oracle proofs and provable security. The Burroughs Abadi Needham logic um, led to the use of a different body of theory, namely semantics uh, and logic, to verify cryptographic protocols. We had people like David Chaum developing complex cryptography using the multiplicative homomorphic properties of discrete log and RSA to produce things like. Um, digital elections and remailers, about which Roger was talking about in the tutorial on Sunday, and digital cash, which is of course related to how elections work. At the same time, during the 80s, there was real deployment. Back in the mid-80s, I was working for Barclays Bank, um, looking after the security of networks of ATMs, and then I did the same thing for Standard Chartered in Hong Kong. And as we built out ATM networks worldwide, we come across a an awful lot of interesting opponents. Back in the late 80s, for example, our big problem was the Chinese army, which was involved in credit card counterfeiting on an industrial scale in Asia. And so we had to invent the CVCs, the three-digit security codes that you get in the mag strips of all uh, credit cards in order to push back on that. In the 1990s, what we saw was firstly a, a greater increase in the practical, usable cryptography modern primitives. The, um, the AES competition was the culmination of a whole lot of work on differential cryptanalysis, linear cryptanalysis, design of block ciphers. 
we ended up getting much deeper and wider theory. Uh, my colleague Larry Paulson, for example, used the Isabel theorem prover um, to verify the core functionality of SSL. We got better engineering. Paul Kutcher came along with DPA, and um, other people came along with various kinds of fault analysis and timing analysis and so on, which taught us that building a crypto library actually involves quite a lot of specialist skills and know-how. At the same time, we saw very wide deployment. We saw pay TV becoming mainstream in most countries of the world. GSM mobile phones, um, another example of a technology that we all carry around with us. And this in itself has got quite a, a number of little bits of crypto in it for enciphering the bitstream, the authentication protocol that runs between your SIM card uh, and um, uh, the network and so on. And of course, there's the widespread use of SSL TLS. And then on the policy side, we had the crypto wars as the NSA decided that it wanted to control all the world's cryptographic keys. And as Microsoft and others decided that this would be a bad idea because it would get in the way of making a buck, and we had a, a good old fight, um, the ramifications of which are still going on. I don't know if you get these in India. We call this a fairy ring in England. You see them quite often in the woods. The idea is that um, when you've got mushrooms growing, they exhaust the nutrients in the soil, and so they keep on growing outwards. And so you often see mushrooms growing in a ring. And this is, I think, a good metaphor for the development of cryptography, because once we have got stuff in the middle fixed, once we have got good working primitives, then the way to go is outwards. Outwards to new applications, outwards to new problems, outwards to um, things that arise as we deploy. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is the problems of scale and complexity, and how do we do cryptographic engineering properly at a global scale. Now, once we start talking about systems which work not just for a few thousand people, but for a few hundreds of millions of people, there's a number of things that we also have to start thinking of. And these have been emerging trends over the past 10 years in research. Security economics is something that's taken up perhaps a third of my time for the past 10 years. Because once you no longer have all your systems in one firm, but spread among thousands of firms which are all competitors with each other, then you have to design the rules so that when each of these firms act selfishly, the equilibrium that results is an equilibrium that you can live with. The internet, for example, is run by about 35,000 firms, 35,000 autonomous systems. And they're simply going to optimize their own welfare. So if you're designing BGP security, which is one of our projects at the moment, the big problem is to see to it that when everybody acts selfishly, the outcome will be something that you can live with. The second big thing is usability. And I think this will be a growing area of security research. Because the world is now different from 25 years ago. Back when I bought my first PCXT, it came with a big, thick manual and an assembler listing of the ROM. If you didn't know how it worked, you could go and follow it through. Nowadays, the PCs are bought by people like my mum. This is no longer the case. You don't get manuals. You learn how to use something by exploring it. And this means that you can't fix stuff by educating the user. And when politicians say, we will fix the cyber security problem by educating the user, you know that they're just throwing their hands up and passing the buck. And then the interesting thing, one of the really interesting things for us as mathematicians and engineers is scale. Many protocols that will work on a lab scale won't work on a global scale. And I'm going to come to some examples. Computer scientists are kind of aware of this. Some algorithms scale as n squared or n cubed or n log n. And of course, you try and get the algorithms that scale as, as um, efficiently as possible. But that's not all. There are other things go wrong when systems become large. And in order to study these, I think it's necessary to look at some of the failures in the real world. You see, during the 1990s, when I was doing my PhD and starting off in a research career, the internet was a harmless playground. The only people who were online were you know, math geeks, uh, CS academics, a few engineers and companies like Microsoft. There was no cyber crime. 
right? Because we were all good guys, we had salaries, we had homes to go to. Uh, nowadays, of course, the world is completely different. Then we were talking about what could go wrong. Now there's lots of stuff that does go wrong, and so we have to study real world failures. So my first case study is banking protocols. EMV, which is known as chip and pin um, in Britain and Ireland, is this new system whereby in your bank cards um, you are starting to get semiconductor chips. I believe this is starting to be deployed in India. So most of you um, will have seen a card with a chip in it. And um, I first did an EMV transaction in India last time I was here two years ago. It didn't work very well. Um, the, the system said wrong pin, but authorized the transaction anyway. Um, I think it's beginning to get um, a little bit more debugged now. But even in Britain, where it's been running for six years, there are still some frightful bugs, as we will see in a minute. Now, one of the interesting things about chip and pin is that the banks set out to achieve what they called a liability shift. Now, what this means is that when the banks move to chip and pin, they change the rules so that if you dispute a transaction, then if the chip was used, they say, sorry, it's your fault. You must be negligent or complicit because you've compromised your pin. But if, on the other hand, a signature was used or it was done um, mail order or telephone order, then they just reverse out the transaction to the merchant. So, wonderful to behold, the bank is no longer liable for fraud. And the banks thought this would be really great and it would make fraud go away. However, if you've got Alice guarding a system and Bob pays the cost of fraud, guess what happens to fraud? So this is what happened in the UK after EMV was introduced. Some types of fraud went down. Um, you can see there, for example, that mail non-receipt went down uh, once the large volume of new cards had been issued. Um, others went up. Card not present is the biggest one that went up, although online banking went up as well. And some went down and then up. Counterfeit, for example, went down because initially the bad guys didn't know how to counterfeit chip cards. And then it went up again as the bad guys learned new strategies that worked. So, in short, crypto changed the landscape. It's as if you've taken a bulldozer and driven it across the fraud landscape, and the rivers of fraud are still flowing. They're just flowing in slightly different channels. And the reason that counterfeit went down and then went up again is that the crooks realized that it's now very easy to steal card and PIN details because everybody expects to use their card and their PIN everywhere, not just in ATMs. So you can easily set up dodgy retail terminals or fake ATMs or whatever, steal card and PIN details, and then use them in terminals that still accept magnetic strip transactions, uh, such as terminals abroad. Now, one of the promises was that the pin entry devices, the device in which you put your card to make your transaction, would be tamper resistant. And these were supposedly common criteria evaluated so that it would take at least $25,000 per individual pin entry device uh, to compromise a pin entry device so that you could um, uh, steal stuff from it. And last time I was in India, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk on how we discovered that tamper resistance basically didn't work. Here, for example, is the uh, set of tamper meshes used in the Ingenico 3300, which is the most common terminal in the UK, and which I've seen here as well. Basically, um, you've got four tamper resistant switches, such that if you take off the lid of the device, a circuit is broken, and the cryptographic key memory is immediately zeroized. Um, those are the four contact pads there. They're just like the contact pads you have for the normal um, um, key, uh, keys on the keypad, except that they're held down by four fixed um, rubber spikes um, on the keypad itself. Thus, if you open the lid, boom, you um, have got a dead terminal. And there's various other things as well. There's meshes and so on. So. 
we went and bought um, a couple of dozen pin entry devices on eBay, and I gave them to the research students, and I said, right, guys, um, see if you can find out how to break these. So they tinkered around for a week or so, and they came back and reported that it was actually really, really easy to break into the pin entry devices, because here again on the Ingenico as an example, if you drilled in just at the back of this little compartment on the back of the device, you could then put a paper clip onto the serial link that links the card to the pin pad. And therefore, you've got the pin going in one direction and the card details going in the other direction, which is everything that you need to do a forgery. So we follow a responsible disclosure policy with this sort of thing. And um, so we told the uh, banks in um, what, October 2007. And then in February 2008, it appeared on the TV. And the bank said, no, nobody could possibly do this because criminals aren't as clever as Cambridge uh, grad students. <laughs> but in fact, it was already happening. Um, and in June, July 2008, um, the police went and arrested a Pakistani chap called Imran Khan. You know, his folks had named him after the cricketer, although he was only about 19. And um, what he'd done together with his brother was to put wicked electronics in Ingenico terminals, and he'd done it uh, by bribing um, his way to get access to the warehouse in Dubai, where these terminals stopped en route from the factory in China to the distribution in the UK and the Netherlands. And so you could go into a shop in Britain or a bank branch in, in Holland, and you could use the official terminal that the shop or even the bank thought was the genuine article, which they got new out of the packaging from China. And inside that terminal was a little mobile phone which would text your card and PIN details to Karachi. And the only way you could tell um, a genuine terminal from a, a bad one was by weighing it. But of course, Visa didn't have a list of official weights of terminals on its website, so how would you know? And this caused a bit of a row because it turned out that the terminals hadn't been properly common criteria evaluated, but GCHQ, which administers the common criteria scheme in the UK, wouldn't defend its brand. And that kicked off a political row, which is still going on to this day. So that's an example of a failure of tamper resistance a failure of certification, and above all, a failure of governance, because GCHQ, as the custodian of the common criteria scheme, um, would have been perfectly within its rights to take down Visa's website as trademark infringing, but it wasn't prepared to take this enforcement action. Now, we've come across a number of vulnerabilities since, and I'm about to show one that we disclosed last year. Uh, we've got some more in the pipeline that will be disclosed uh, next February, but you'll just have to wait for them because of the responsible disclosure policy. Here is what the protocol looks like. First of all, the card sends its card details to the terminal, and these are protected by digital signature. That's a static signature that's generated by the bank when the card is issued. Second, the customer is asked for a PIN. Third, the merchant terminal sends the PIN and the transaction description to the card. Fourth, the card sends an OK, a yes or no, and an authorization cryptogram, which is calculated on the um, um, amount in the card on um, a number used once, an unpredictable number, uh, a terminal serial number, and various other bits and pieces. And one of the things that we observed is that the um, the binding between the cryptogram and the, and, 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 and the uh, pin OK message um, is rather indirect. And so what we discovered is that it was possible to do a middle person attack such that if you put a device, say a fake card, in between the terminal and the real card, it's possible for the fake card to give a false OK response, um, even if the crook didn't actually enter the right pin at the terminal. The fake card. Um, can then send a transaction a specification to the card that's modified such that it's sent without a PIN and the fake card says what we're doing is a chip and signature transaction rather than a chip and PIN transaction. And now here's a piece of TV with which this was announced on February last year. I will say your question might be that most people don't think twice about PIN.
paying for something in a high street shop by keying in our PIN. It's easy, it's fast, and in most cases it works. But scratch a little under the surface and there are persistent reports of people who say they've been the subject of fraud of one kind or another on their credit card or their debit card. Now a team of computer scientists at Cambridge University has found a flaw in chip and pin so serious they think it shows that the whole system needs a rewrite. Our science editor Susan Watts has the story. We have to question the, the entire uh, architecture uh, that surrounds chip and pin. It really is time for um, a closer look to be taken in this whole area. But this flaw is really a flopper. Well, we think this is one of the biggest flaws um, that we've ever uncovered, that has ever been uncovered against payment systems. And, you know, I've been in this business 25 years. This is um, a flaw on a system that's used by hundreds of millions of people, by tens of thousands of banks, by millions of merchants. So how does the attack work? Essentially what it does is exploit a flaw in the chip and pin system that allows the terminal to think that a correct pin was entered and the car to think that a signature authorized the transaction. So at the end, the receipt says verified by pin. The bank is going to think that the pin was entered correctly, but uh, the criminal actually did not know the pin. Cambridge University gave us permission to see if the attack works in real life. The team set up in one of the university's cafeterias. We obviously don't want to give out too much detail, but in simple terms, Star is hooking up the stolen card to a chip. This is controlled from a laptop and runs software written by the team. All of this is hooked up to a fake card which slots into the actual shop terminal. The chip wouldn't have to be this big. The team is already working on miniaturizing it into a unit the size of a remote control. Sam has a trick up his sleeve. His dummy card has a concealed cable running up his arm to the kit in his backpack. So will it work? He doesn't need to know the actual pin from the stolen card. Any combination should do. The stolen card is getting a message that the purchase has been authorized by signature. This mismatch should allow the transaction to go ahead. And yes, it does. The printout states it's been verified by the PIN. In fact, Sarah tries a handful of high street debit and credit cards, keying in 0000 at the PIN, and it worked every time. So is this attack happening in the real world? The Consumers Association thinks chip and pin has helped to bring down instances of card crime, but many cases remain unexplained. It's very difficult to quantify exactly how big this problem is. What we do know from our um, investigations is that, say, around 14% of, of, of consumers on a representative basis will accept that they have suffered some kind of um, financial loss, which they believe is through fraud. The percentage of that, which is actually from uh, this type of potential problem with chip and pin, is something that's a lot less clear. What we do know is that we do have cases that are brought forward from individuals which seem quite persuasive. We understand that behind the scenes, some of the banks are already working on fixing this flaw. But they obviously haven't all fixed it yet, because the banks didn't alert any of us to the purchases we made using the Cambridge attack, our card, and a PIN 0000. Well, thereby like hangs a tail. And it's been a, oh, wrong button, never mind. So um, this has led to a, a long tail of um, toings and froings. Um, last year, um, Barclays started working on a fix, and around about um, May, they sent um, one of their um, one of the guys from one of their suppliers ran to us and we sat down with them and explained what was going on and how you could fix this either by blocking at the terminal or at the issuer or at the acquirer and if you're the card issuer then you have to basically work on a solution that's close to your um, issuing systems otherwise you're not in practice going to be able to deploy it 
So the trick is to match up the information that is sent back by the card with the information that's sent back by the terminal. And they duly built and deployed a system in about July last year, um, which did this checking and which stopped us doing this fraud against the um, university systems, which um, used Barclays as an, um, an issuer. Then in December last year, the Cards Association wrote to our university and requested that the thesis uh, of one of our students be taken offline because it was uh, potentially helpful to villains. Uh, now, we simply took this as a, uh, an attack on academic freedom and told them, no, we're not going to do it. Um, thereafter, we went out and tested the attack again, and it turned out that the countermeasure had been removed. Barclays had stopped doing this checking, and nobody else was doing it. And we suspect it's probably because they were getting too high a rate of false positives, and they thought it would be simpler just to try and get the university to shut up than actually to secure their systems. So, um, where does this leave us? Well, the, 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 the vulnerability is still there, and we have information that it's, um, it's being exploited here and there, as are a number of other protocol failures on EMV. Another widely exploited protocol failure is the middle person attack. Now there are ATMs, which have got a, a proper chip card slot rather than a, a mag stripe throat. It becomes easy, for example, to set up a, a, a bogus parking meter in somewhere like France with such ATMs. So somebody goes and puts the card into a parking meter, and this is then hooked up by radio to a false card, and the runner with the false card hears that there's somebody at the parking meter, so he goes to an ATM, puts in the card, and the transaction is then simply relayed, so that the, so that the, the victim thinks he's spending two euros on getting parking, when actually he's taking 500 euros out of an ATM. And that sort of thing appears to be happening in France. Um, there are various other um, strange um, fallback um, modes and um, uh, other things that we're looking at, and there are further protocol failures that we'll be discussing in due course. Now, the fundamental problem here is a governance problem. When EMV was being designed in, in the late 1990s, um, there was a coherent group of people under EMV Co. working together on it, and they did bring in respectable academic um, uh, uh, consultants. I mean, one well-known professor from a European university told me after this came out, Ross, he said, don't blame me. We told them at every step what the options were, whether they could have a secure option, a less secure option, or a really cheap option, and they went for the really cheap option every single time. So, hey, they were warned. <laughs> uh, but now, um, this system is ungovernable, because it is something that is deployed on such a scale that it is, in effect, being driven by about 100 large vendor companies. The banks themselves, individually, have got no incentive to stand up and say, now, hang on a minute, we need version 5 of the EMV spec to be properly written. The best opportunity that I can see for fixing it um, is by getting the central banking authorities in countries which are about to adopt it to um, insist that it be engineered properly before it's introduced into their, into their country. And I've talked a couple of times at Federal Reserve conferences, and I'm talking again at a Fed conference in March, saying, guys, if you let this into the USA at scale, then you've really got to ensure that EMV version 5 is properly done, which means that um, the, the, the kind of optional stuff that people missed out and which led to this attack that we've just seen has to become mandatory. So um, another interesting thing about this that we've just learned in the past couple of weeks is that the response of the vendors is no longer saying, we can sell you some software which will fix the no-pin attack and do stuff about relays and so on and so forth. And the reason for that is that the, is, is, is that the market for people who sell cards, back-end software, and other products to the banks is so fragmented and so specialized that the people who would sell fixes to the protocol have got nothing to do with the people who sell cards. And the big money is, of course, for the people who sell cards and terminals. So the big push from the industry nowadays is to persuade the banks to upgrade all their cards to elliptic curve cryptography, right? Because that way you can make an awful lot of money selling cards for 70 cents instead of 50 cents, right? Multiplied by a billion cards, and that's quite a lot of dosh. So the push is not to fix the flaw, but to put further armor on the part of the protocol that's not broken at all. So that was one case study. 
Second case study of how complexity causes real world cryptography to not work is the case of API security. And if you look at how systems like EMV, and in fact even uh, many large e-commerce systems uh, are architected, you end up having devices called security modules being used to do the hardware crypto. Um, this may be done for reasons of trust, or it may be done for reasons of acceleration. If you've got a server that's doing a thousand transactions per second, um, then the way you do that with SSL is by having a hardware box with a number of ARM processors in it, which does all the public key cryptography. So what you end up with is an, an API, an application programming interface, which sits between a less trusted system, your host, think of it as a mainframe if you want, and the security module, which may be a separate box or it may be a PCI card that sits in some of the PCs that you use. And the interesting thing about this from the point of view of computer science is that it's the boundary between a more trusted system and a less trusted system. And historically, computer science um, academics have studied this in terms of information flow, Bell La Padula and so on. But there's something else going on that's interesting. Here's an example of the sort of security modules that you get. Top left is the IBM 4758, um, which was the first device certified to level 4 in FIPS 140. That is certified unbreakable. Top right is the um, um, Thales security module, which is the biggest selling one in banking. Bottom left is one that's used in um, prepayment electricity meter systems. Um, that forms the core of the token vending machines that one finds in shops and gas stations and so on. And bottom right um, is the Encipher, um, now also bought by Thales, which is the leading product used as SSL accelerators and e-commerce websites. So that's what these things look like. And we started looking at these a few years ago. And what we found when we looked at the manuals is that the typical security module has got between 50 and 500 transactions that it supports. Because it ends up supporting a raft of transactions for ATMs. You know, generate PIN, verify PIN, translate a PIN from one network key to another. It then ends up acquiring a number of other transactions to support EMV. Um, for example, encrypt a key and send it to a card or authenticate a software update so that it can be sent to a card and so on and so forth. And then there are all the key management commands, encrypt a new key under an old key, or split a key into three parts so that it can be shared with Visa, and so on and so forth. Once you have done the real engineering, these things end up fairly complex. And so when Mike Bond joined me as a research student, I gave him the manual for the IBM 4758, which was over 400 pages. And I said, Mike, there's got to be a bug in there. It's too big to be bug free. Find the bug. So he came back three weeks later and said, found the bug. And that was a false alarm. But he came back a week after that, and he found a bug. And this was a real bug, which led to a real attack, which I'll show you next. But here as an example of the sort of thing that goes wrong with these hardware crypto APIs, there was an HSM transaction defined five years ago to send a new cryptographic key to an EMV card. So when you put your bank card in an ATM, your own bank's hardware security module can upgrade it. And this is done by sending um, a variable length message, which is basically some software instructions, followed by the cryptographic key, all encrypted using a key, that, a long-term key shared between your card and, and, and the bank security module. Now, the problem was that since there was a variable length field of text followed by a key, this meant that you could arrange for the first byte of the key to be inside one of the CVC block boundaries. And that meant that if you were the programmer, and remember the threat model here is that the bank's programmer is a bad guy trying to get the keys out, then you could send this variable length text message of a length to cause that to happen, right? And you could also send a slightly longer message, a one byte longer message where the extra byte was a zero, and another message where the next byte was a one, and so on. Now, the security module then, instead of taking your message, concatenating it with the key that it 
generated, making up the overall message and sending it off, would then just encrypt these series of test messages. And so by comparing um, the 256 test messages that you generated with length n plus 1 with the target message that you sent with length n, it could then figure out which uh, was the first byte of the key. And then, of course, by doing it again, you could get the second byte of the key and the third byte of the key and so on. And so one byte at a time, you could work out what the clear text value was of the new key that was being sent to the card. The interesting thing about this vulnerability is that it turned up in the specification that Visa sent out to the industry. And so every compliant hardware security module in the world ended up implementing a vulnerability that would enable a dishonest programmer to get keys out. Well, no, the, the threat model is that the bank programmer is dishonest. So, so, so you have the security module in order to prevent the bank programmer being able um, to work out the clear value of cards and pins. And the reason for this is that the bank wants to be able to say to the world, um, if somebody disputes a transaction, you're the only person in the world who knows your pin. Nobody in the bank knows your pin. Therefore, it is your fault that the transaction has gone wrong. Now, if I'm a dishonest insider and I can harvest a million um, keys and pins and so on, then that's disastrous for the bank. There's been at least one case where a bank had to reissue its card base because of an internal compromise. So that's the thing that they, above all, don't want to happen. Because firstly, there's the cost of a reissue, and secondly, there's, the bank would feel very uncomfortable if it couldn't say, our systems are perfect, therefore it's your fault. Now, there's a separate discussion about whether the bank should be allowed to say that at all on regulatory grounds, uh, but that's the game as it's played. Here's a simpler attack, and this is, in fact, one of the first ones that was discovered here. If you are sending a key between a host security module and, say, the security module in a cash machine, how this is typically done is that you generate two key components, basically two DES keys, each of them is printed on a pin mailer. You give one to the branch accountant and the other to the branch uh, manager. And they take them to the ATM. They put them in at the keyboard at the back. They then close the machine. They press the button. And you've then got a two key, three DES um, option to encrypt further keys. Except in a number of ATMs, this used to be encrypted. This, um, in, in, in most ATMs, this is implemented in the form of XRing two key components together. So how this works is that you have got a transaction whereby the user says to the security module, generate a key component. The hardware security module prints a component on a printer, and it also sends back to the programmer the key encrypted under a master key that's kept in the security module. What you then do is you combine the components, because once you've printed out your two pin mailers, you send to the security module, here is one encrypted key and here is a second encrypted key, please combine them. The security module then decrypts them, XORs them together, and returns you the result. And you may be able to see what goes wrong with that, because the attack is that you just send the same key component twice. And then, of course, the same key, encrypted key value, XORed with itself is zero. So the device returns to you the zero key encrypted under a master key. And this zero key is then of a type to be treated as a master key within the system. So you can encrypt stuff with it. You can encrypt pins with it, for example. And since you know how to do decryption using DES with the zero key, you can now get the pins out in the clear. And what was happening here was, in effect, that there were two types of stuff going on. There was, the, there was the cryptography going on. And on the other hand, there was some type theory going on. Because in effect, those keys that were protected by master keys um, were being designated as being keys of particular types. This key. Um, is a terminal master key. This key is a pin encryption key, and so on. And that was never written down, and it was never understood. But of course, a computer scientist would understand that type theory is sometimes important. 
but hey, it's not taught in the same, in the same um, lecture series as cryptography. So maybe you have people who did the crypto course but didn't do the type theory course. So like Christoph yesterday, I'm going through a number of case histories. And the, the third case history that I want to touch on briefly is crypto infrastructure. Back in the 1990s, we had attempts by the NSA and others to control cryptography. There was also an attempt um, by the browser vendors, by Microsoft and others, uh, to control cryptography by only having a restricted number of CAs in the browser. What happened as a result was that it became very valuable to be a CA um, when um, Thought, for example, got bought over by VeriSign. Um, VeriSign paid $500 million for Thought, which was great if you were Mark Shuttleworth, who owned um, Thought. He then uh, went and bought himself a, a ticket to be um, an astronaut as a tourist for millions and millions of dollars. But it ended up with VeriSign having a, a near monopoly 10 years ago. People complained about that, and then the browser vendors decided to open it up almost completely. And now if you look at your Windows PC, you'll find that it trusts about 600 different CAs. And this is a big deal, because just about every country on Earth has got its CA in the browser now, so that it can use this to do attacks. Back in February last year, we had a discussion on this at Financial Cryptography, and we had somebody there from the Mozilla Foundation who runs, uh, who, who maintain Firefox. And I put a question to him saying, look, this morning, um, I upgraded Firefox because you prompted me to. And it replaced a certificate that I had removed, namely from Tubitac, which is the Turkish secret police. Um, so I said, why does the Mozilla Foundation, a US charity, feel that it has to override my express personal wishes and ensure that the Turkish secret police can install wicked software in my machine. And at this point, a man jumps up from the audience and says, I am from Turkey. How dare you insult my country? Tubitech is not the secret police. It is a research organization. Oh, sure, hey. Yeah, but so the guy from Mozilla then says, well, you see the problem we have. We are running an open platform. Who are we to sit in judgment on some organization from some country who says we want to run a CA? Please go and design for us an open, transparent, um, and robust protocol for deciding which CAs you put in the browser. OK. So we have the browser containing certificates from all sorts of government authorities and their, their proxies, except, of course, Iran, because Iran's under sanctions. So what do the Iranians do? They simply break into other people's CAs. So they can issue false certificates for monitoring the Gmail of people in Iran. And we've had a couple of problems. We've had the Komodo problem. So Komodo um, issued a whole lot of false certificates. So I removed the Komodo CA from my browser. And then I found I couldn't buy plane tickets on EasyJet. Right? You see, this is a real problem. And then recently, um, the Iranians took over another uh, CA, DigiNotar. And because DigiNotar issued false certificates for Google, which were actually used in Iran, Google simply administered the death penalty. Bang! You know, um, DigiNotar was thrown out of the Chrome browser and out of the Firefox browser. And Microsoft very quickly followed. And this caused panic in the Netherlands, because DigiNotar was the CA used by the Dutch government. And all of a sudden, none of the Dutch public service websites would work. And there was a total panic, because none of the various heads of department, permanent secretaries and so on in the Netherlands had any idea that they were depending on DigiNotar. They had given out a facilities management contract, who got a subcontractor, who'd asked Fred to get a certificate, and he got his brother to get his credit card and go online and buy one, and then everybody forgot about it. So that taught the Dutch a very, very hard lesson that you should understand who it is you're trusting for your government systems. And at present, in civil government, that's just not the case. In short, this whole system is completely broken. And how are we going to fix it? And it's not something we can ignore, because if the current proposals for trusted boot come along, then um, you will end up with PCs um, only running operating systems or um, other boot time software, such as AV software, that has been signed by somebody trustworthy. What does trustworthy mean? Well, lots of governments, including ours, put their key loggers 
on machines of targets of criminal investigation. So our governments are going to insist that they have got the ability to sign malware. So we go back round the whole circle again. All the respectable governments will have their C's in, CAs in there, and the bad governments will break into other people's CAs. Surely we can think of a better way of running the world than this. Or do we just completely abandon the idea of having centralized trust infrastructures? You see, this is a core problem in cryptography, and yet it touches on pretty well every um, subject in the, um, in, in the curriculum. It's, it's bound up with economics, it's bound up with politics, it's bound up with strategic studies, it spills over into just about every other department you can think of. So my point is that even if you try and come up with a technical solution for the CA problem, the forces that broke the CA system are still in play. And so it's important to understand these. This brings me on to security economics, which has been a thriving field for about 10 years. As I've mentioned, big systems have many stakeholders, and if Alice does the maintenance but Bob pays the cost of failure, then systems will fail. At the level of cryptographic protocols, the initial costs and the maintenance costs typically fall on different people. And at present, the design work that we've done for protocols has mostly been on the initial cost. How do you go about setting up the CA and so on, rather than about the maintenance cost? How do you run the revocation service? How do you deal with the software upgrades? How do you deal with ongoing certification? Another way in which protocols fail um, is featureitis. Just about everything that we have in the online world and in fact even electronics like mobile phones, end up with so many features on them, right, that an um, unbelievable number of apps, pages and pages of apps, anything you could possibly want is in there, you just haven't found it yet. So at equilibrium, every device has so many features in it that there are bound to be many feature interactions that will break it. Okay, API attacks. That's exactly what happens. You put more and more features into your crypto until it breaks. Or certification failures, as we saw with EMV. Now, protocols are particularly difficult because protocols like SSL or the um, Visa transaction set or whatever are not regulated by the state. And they're very often not regulated by a private company. And so that's a classic governance failure. In the case of individual CAs, they are regulated by a company, namely the company that runs the CA, but, but there was a race to the bottom. How much do you pay for a certificate nowadays? 50 rupees? Hey, how do you make money selling certificates at 50 rupees? You don't check anything that you can't check automatically. Other problems with security economics include the fact that Information, goods, and services markets are liable to monopoly uh, because of network effects and technical lock-in and low, market, uh, low marginal costs. And this means that you have to appeal to your developers, your complementers. So if you're um, a product manager at Google and you're fighting it out with Apple over dominance in the phone market, then your job is to see to it that there's more stuff going through the, the Android app store than going through the Apple app store which means that you make, it easy, you make it easier to write apps for Android than it is to write for, um, for iOS. And this means that you end up doing the thing um, in an insecure way, and you then try and put security on later. Now, the strategic problem is that once we start getting software everywhere, once you start having CPUs and communications and everything that you buy for more than about 500 rupees, and once all these things start talking to each other, right, the whole world is going to become much more like the software industry. There will be monopolies. There will be the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is programmability. Um, the bad will be featureitis, and the ugly will be monopolies. And how do we go about evolving our policy apparatus to cope with that? And what happens when everybody has got 50 or 100 programmable devices on their person or even implanted in your body. You know, if your medical implants are talking to your mobile phone and talking to your laptop and so on. And there's not just the 
overt communications going on, but also the various commercial tussles for control, for surveillance, for access. Suppose you have a parliament of cyborgs. What would be the issues that would make everybody really, really excited? You may think this is a long way from India's current state, but believe me, you know, add 20 years of economic development plus 20 years of technical development, and this is the place that we will be in the lifetime of, of most people here, and I hope I'll live long enough to see it, because there's going to be some really fun and bizarre um, <coughs> issues that we're going to have to cope with. As we're getting short of time, I'll skip over the next couple of slides very quickly. I'll mention that there was one um, system that we were involved in designing, Homeplug AV, uh, which you may find being used to talk between your DSL modem and your, your Wi-Fi repeaters. This is a power line communication system, which comes in single chips, low power chips, 155 meg along your mains. And particularly in Asia, it's important to encrypt these because of the large number, numbers of people who live in tower blocks, particularly in places like Seoul and Tokyo. Otherwise, you know, your consumer electronics would end up talking to the electronics of people in the apartment above you or even three stories above you. How do you do key management there? Well, this is an example of how very widely deployed systems can use very local key management. Because in Homeplug, basically, we use something that we describe as the resurrecting duckling protocol. You know, when a duckling comes out of an egg, it bonds to the first moving object it sees as its mother. Similarly, when you take a home plug device out of the packaging, it'll bond to the first network controller it sees. Now, that can involve sending a key in the clear. Um, there is a more secure option that involves typing one in, but most people don't bother with it. And that's perfectly OK. Um, provided there are going to be no active attacks and provided there's no surveillance going on on power up. So here's an example where you put no effort at all into the initial authentication protocol and you rely on the fact of long-term binding to provide adequate security for purpose. And the flip side is that there are cases where you can do revocation at almost zero cost. Now, this is, again, something that we come up with, the idea of suicide bombing. Um, if you have got moats, in other words, ad hoc networks made of low-cost um, devices, and one device observes that another device is misbehaving, and you want to remove it from circulation, then you can do it in a heavyweight way using central servers or by using um, some kind of voting mechanism. But again, we found that there are a number of circumstances in which it's economic for the moat which observes another moat misbehaving to simply declare both of them to be dead. I am Alice. I declare that Bob is evil, and I declare that both of us are now dead. Right? Is actually the efficient way to do revocation in a number of circumstances where the costs of creating a new moat uh, and so on are in the right ranges. And this is also interesting from the scientific point of view because it gives us an insight into those cases in nature um, where, for example, bees will commit suicide by stinging um, somebody who is attacking the bee nest. In the case of bees, it's economic to sacrifice a bee rather than to maintain a more elaborate communication system uh, between the guards and the hive. So the extent to which we need large centralized infrastructures is something that has to be examined in terms of locality of action, in terms of um, the costs of the resources that you're going to use, and the value of the resources that you're trying to protect. And finally, this is a big work in progress. I've got a research student working on it at the moment. Uh, we're working with a number of um, um, big players, and um, we're writing new grant applications and hoping to expand our work in the field. In February, we wrote a report on the security of the internet interconnection infrastructure. This is basically BGP. How do you stop incidents such as the one last year in, in April 2010? Uh, when China Telecom hijacked about 15% of the internet for 18 minutes. How would you stop something like that being done in times of tension? Now, it could be done, it could be done by a large ISP misbehaving, and we think we're almost sure that in the China Telecom case it was just an operator error rather than somebody testing a cyber nuke. Um, um, 
but it could also be done uh, by a sub-state group. Suppose, for example, you had environmental activists that decided to take down the internet as a protest. They could write some malware that would infect Juniper routers, for example, and that would broadcast lots of false routes and pull, pull them down again in such a way that would tear up the routing infrastructure to, to announce that he's got a route to a particular block of IP addresses or not. And that will fix some but not all of the attacks that we know of on BGP. And here the kind of problems are, how do we deploy it? Because the autonomous systems who would deploy this have got difficulty getting local and incremental benefit from it. Root filtering, um, which is what's done at the moment and what you would do more of as a result of uh, BGPSEC uh, being deployed, people either do too much or not enough. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we've discovered that appears to be new is that many of the root leaks um, that cause problems in that are actually failures of, of root filtering. Typically, a root, a root leak happens because an AS somewhere, typically at the, uh, the second tier, decides to remove um, a root filter to put in a new one. And as they remove the root filter, um, they suddenly end up um, announcing 10 or 20,000 roots simply as a side effect of that, some of which are blocked by some of their peers and, and others of which aren't. So the whole engineering of this um, is, is, is very flaky, and doing it better is difficult because most ASs keep their routing tables um, confidential. There are also fundamental economic problems, such as if you're going to provide dependable routing, you have to have excess capacity. And how do you persuade autonomous systems to have this? Now, in the world of electricity, um, we have mechanisms, at least in Europe, um, to purchase extra capacity so that there's spinning reserve in case somebody suddenly shuts down a power station. There's no such mechanism on the internet. And now that the internet is consolidating into a small number of players, it's difficult to see how we can put it together. So we come up with a report with 11 recommendations, and I'm going to just zip through them because we're getting short on time. We want better data, we want better metrics, the interesting thing for protocol designers is that we want inter-domain routing with decent incentives for deployment, and then we need to figure out better um, mechanisms uh, and incentives for resilience at the AS level, better testing and so on and so forth. You can read the report, which is, um, which is of course, on my website, and there's a number of public, public policy issues around it as well. But that's an example of the sort of big internet scale authentication problem that we're wrestling with nowadays. And it is not trivial. It's something where, in order to get the protocol design right, you have to really think hard about the economics, about the policy, and about how stuff will be operationalized, not just at huge, big um, outfits like Level 3, which have got lots of people to figure out how to do stuff, but at all the small little uh, mum and pop ASs that you find all around the world. So, where might India's competitive advantage be? Well, I think the big opportunity for India is the huge scale of your software industry. In Britain, we graduate 12,000 programmers a year, and Infosys last year hired 30,000. Right? So India could hire Britain's entire output, and France's entire output, and half of Germany's entire output as well, and that's just one company. And the figures for the numbers of programmers graduated in India that I, I hear range from the low hundreds of thousands to the high hundreds of thousands. Now, at present, India may be largely doing contract development work, but given the scale and the growing quality of operations in places like Bangalore and Hyderabad and Mysore and so on, that's not going to remain the case forever. We've got a reasonably good idea of what trajectory can be expected by looking at how China developed. You know, they're, they're 15 years ahead of you guys, but we can look at what's happened with China and make reasonable predictions. And I think it's reasonable to expect that as time goes on, Indian software companies will stop being the contractors and will start ever more being the principals. That means that your industry will be in the business of inventing and deploying very, very large-scale distributed systems, which means that you, the Indian crypto community, will be called upon to design industrial strength, industrial scale protocols that will work over networks of hundreds or even thousands of millions of machines. In other words, moving from cryptology to cryptographic engineering. That, I think, is the sort of thing 
that you should be thinking about when choosing your research topics and when designing your undergraduate courses. Because cryptographic engineering, to put it bluntly, is in a fairly bad state, right? We developed all these tools through the 70s and 80s, and they're really designed for stuff on lab scale. When we started doing them on planetary scale, all sorts of stuff has broken, as I've been describing today. And so we're going to have to develop cryptographic engineering 2.0, and this is a good place to do that, and a good place to be a test bed. Because even when you develop domestic systems here, ID cards, elections, mobile phone payments, hey, you know, you're talking about a billion users. That's the scale of a global system. You have got all the economics problems with the private and public sector fighting and different states fighting with each other and different companies competing with each other. You've got the usability problems of enormous variation um, in levels of education of you know, dozens of different language communities. You have got um, you know, uh, a great development lab here. Um, the South African Tourist Board had a, had a slogan, the world in one country. They were referring to the diversity of natural environments. Um, here in India, you could adapt the, the same slogan to the diversity of human environments and the diversity of commercial environments, which are, of course, what is really important from the point of view of design, designing global scale systems. So cryptographic engineering is important. India is well placed to be competitive at it. And from the point of view of the research community, I think that much of the running in research will be driven by the fact that as everything goes online, as we get embedded systems in everything, the online world and the physical world merge. And in order to build this, you need to produce systems architects who understand a wide range of stuff. You know, the economics and the psychology and the systems engineering and the cryptography and the operating system security and all the rest of it. And they're going to need the tools that will enable them to do the cryptographic engineering. And what this means, I think, is that we will continue the progression that we have seen from the 1970s when people were talking about crypto algorithms. Um, 1980s, we had crypto processors and crypto libraries. The libraries more and more in the 90s and early 2000s were adopting all the new engineering techniques to stop VPA and so on and so forth, and to encapsulate stuff, um, you know, support for Kerberos, support for SSL in ways that were more or less idiot-proof. We saw some of the difficulties of that, um, both at the technical and organizational level. What's going to be needed in the future is something a little bit higher level, and I don't yet know quite how to define it, but let's call it crypto frameworks. In other words, there'll be a whole toolkit um, which will consist not just of libraries and processors, but also of ways of doing stuff, of back-end resources, of CAs, or whatever comes after CAs, of ways of dealing with revocation, of ways of dealing with issuance of passwords and pins to users. In other words, infrastructure that works and which people can use to build on. Now, we're some of the way towards that, but there's a whole bunch of missing pieces. And there's a huge number of opportunities for researchers to get together, make this vision reality, and create all the tools that we need to do stuff. So that's my view on where things are going in the future and where the uh, particular opportunity for India may be. So I'll, I'll take any questions if, if you want. Then, okay, uh, responsible disclosure for, for holding off on telling the public about bugs for, say, six months. Are you sure that that's responsible? Aren't you rewarding the people who are selling bad systems and punishing people who are selling good systems? Because if you disclosed faster, you would be giving re rewards for people actually designing some security. We've had a lot of experience of this over the years. Um, when we first um, broke the IBM 4758, that was in about um, 2004, 2005. Uh, here's, here's this system that IBM had claimed and the US government had endorsed was unbreakable, and it turned out to be easy to break. So we, um, we sent off details of the break to um, Don and the lads at um, IBM. And we said, we're going to submit this to Auckland next year, so you've got 10 months to get your act. 
And the week before we were due to go to Auckland, I was sitting at lunch next to IBM as head of banking for Europe, Middle East, and Africa in a conference in Stuttgart. And I said, well, how are you getting on with dealing with the 4758 bug? And he said, what bug? And it turned out that the crypto people that were um, arguing with the um, crypto toolkit people in North Carolina for the whole period about ability it was, and they hadn't told the business side at all. So all of a sudden that got through, and a large number of copies of our uh, preprint were downloaded from the secret URL. But it was only actually went public at Auckland that IBM got off its butt and fixed it. You see, you can't think of a company that size as being you know, a single individual rational player. It's an enormous bureaucracy with thousands of staff, each of which is optimizing his own utility, covering his ass, pass, passing the buck, and so on. And without you know, vigorous disclosure, you're not going to shift anything. But if, on the other hand, you just go the bug track route, um, then um, you know, you marginalize yourself and undermine your own credibility. Now, even when we give, um, we've, we've got a big vulnerability of a bunch of ATMs that's coming out in February, for example, and we'll be um, warning the Euro European Central Bank and the Fed and so on of this about next week. If we didn't give them um, 45 days or 60 days or whatever to get their act together, it would undermine the effectiveness of the whole process, even if, as a matter of fact, they won't actually get off their butts until after the public announcement. Ah, thank you. Ah, oh, very nice poster, thank you. And the next session will start at 11.15 because uh, the last speaker is missing. So the session will be chaired by Mridul Nandi and uh, you can upload your talks in the machine there during the tea break. <laughs>